Welcome to the conversation. I'm Carrie Ann. I'll be your host for this segment. With me, of course, I've got Jared, our resident astronomer. Mm -hmm. I also have Mike, our rocket specialist. And behind me, of course, I have Dada, who will be producing this show. Today in news, uh, Mike is actually going to catch us up on some launches of this past week. Jared is going to let us know what we found on Mars. And in our interview segment, Jared's also going to be sitting down with Stuart Money to discuss the history of SpaceX. That should be a fun one. And of course, we take a look at our comments and questions from last week's show. This is tomorrow, Orbit 10.33. Good morning. How's everything up in the sky? And welcome. Of course, at the top of the show, I want to make sure we give a huge thank you to all of our Patreon supporters. These are of the Escape Velocity variety. They get their name in all three segments of the show. Of course, they get ex exclusive access to our Patreon-only hangouts, early access to After Dark. There's a whole list of slew of things that they get access to. Actually, one of my favorite things is voting rights on upcoming roundtable discussions, which we should be having at the end of this month. So if you're interested in these or any other things like that, you can head on over to Patreon.com com slash tmro okay so we had a launch aboard and a launch this week mike why don't you catch yeah. us up on what happened well first off was the launch aboard and uh what this was was Ariane space was attempting to launch two american-made communication satellites on their Ariane 5 rocket and this was supposed to launch on tuesday and the time for that was going to be 2151 coordinated universal time mm -hmm. and this was launching from the guiana space center which i just realized i've been mistakenly calling corot space center for years now it's officially the guiana space center oh, no. huh. But uh, let's, uh, with this launch, too, the, uh, the main engine of it did ignite for it and did throttle up to full power before the solid rocket boosters. Oi. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, top. Allumage Vulcan. Tous de DDO tir avorté. So at this point is where they realized that they had a problem. Mm -hmm. Only seven seconds were supposed to have elapsed between the ignition of the core stage engine, the Vulcan 2, and the ignition of the two side-mounted solid rocket boosters, which obviously did not ignite. Now, a routine computer health checks on the rocket detected a, a, a problem, which triggered an automatic abort, although the exact cause wasn't known initially. In a statement, though, the next day, Ariane Space said that there was an electrical glitch with one of the solid rocket boosters, but didn't go into further detail. Could have been a problem with the ignition system itself or with the avionics. Either way, they would have had a disastrous launch if that had ignited with that sort of problem. Yeah, but I was just going to say, that could have been so much worse. Are. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Goodness. All just right. imagine if only one of them ignited and it just leaped, left off the pad and, and <sighs> went on the other side. Or even did lift off uh, uh, initially really well, but yeah, the no. uh, avionics weren't able to adjust correctly and just goes off course and still would be a unsuccessful flight. But yeah. in any case, they rolled it back to their vehicle assembly building and uh, they're probably going to be trying again. They're hoping to try later this month. The last time that this happened was in March of 2011 when they had an abort after the Vulcan engine had already ignited. And with that mission, with that particular mission, they were able to turn that one around in three weeks. So okay. hopefully they'll be able to do the same this time. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, uh, again, of all of the the things that could possibly go wrong, this one is uh, it's disappointing, but it's at least everyone's safe. So that's that's exactly good. that's the main point. The rocket is safe. Both of the payloads are safe. You know, they were able to defuel the rocket and and have everything be just fine. So I almost want to call this not necessarily a launch abort. Maybe this was a successful static fire test. I don't know. <laughs> there you go, an extra static fire test. <laughs> Oh, Cut some yeah. data on the, on the engine. I mean, that's 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 the scientific way, though, right? Like, it's, it doesn't matter if you fail yeah. as long sure. as you're uh, sure. curating as data. As long as you learn something. As long as you learn something. So, yeah. All right. right. Well, there we did right. actually have a launch this last week. Why don't you tell us how that went? 
Yes, a successful launch. And this was, of course, SpaceX's successful launch of their Falcon 9 rocket on Thursday. And with this launch, it was a, a little bit hairy because they were kind of chasing or racing a storm, rather. Mm -hmm. But they were able to successfully launch at 1400 coordinated universal time on Thursday, September 7th. Yes. And from the historic Launch Complex 39A at Cape Canaveral. Love it. Five, four, three, two, one. Now, when I said that this launch was a race against the weather, uh, they literally were kind of pushing it to the last second before the Falcon 9 rocket could take off, or rather, before ground crews would need to secure the vehicle for incoming Hurricane Irma, which is a Category 5 storm, which may or may not hit the Cape as soon as Sunday, and it's uh, getting closer, but we'll see how that goes. In any case, the payload for this mission was the fifth mission of the secretive X-37B mini robotic space shuttle, shuttle for the United States Air Force. And the Falcon 9 rocket, which produced 1.7 million pounds of thrust, uh, separated the first stage and second stage on time, and was able to uh, do the boost, boost back burns and the coast back to the landing zone at near the launch site. And with this, uh, wow, we were able to get the camera feed all the way down to this and see the, the first stage land back successfully at landing zone one. And I'm assuming that it was possible to get that uninterrupted video feed because the better bandwidth at the Cape instead of on the drone ships out at sea where the footage is sometimes interrupted for a moment. But I thought that this was just really awesome. And this was actually the 16th successful launch that SpaceX has been able to do since their first successful landing at this pad, Landing Zone 1, back in 2015. And uh, this was really awesome. Um, but for this, the, the payload, even though it's a very secretive X-37B, uh, there was some information that the Air Force was able to give for it. Now, all the Four previous missions of the X-37B rode on United, Lan United Launch Alliance's Atlas V rocket, but ULA claims they didn't even get to bid for this. And the Air Force has proven that this mini space shuttle can stay on orbit for several years. And there was one experiment that they did disclose that they were going to be testing on this. And it was these uh, three oscillating heat pipes, which mm. oscillating heat pipes are important because it's kind of like the reverse of a computer fan, but uh, to try to keep things warm enough and at the, the right temperatures in space. So it's, it's the opposite of a computer pan, fan for uh, space computers. And we'll see how that goes. <laughs> I doubt that we'll see any sort of data from that. But uh, still kind of cool that they're becoming a little bit more public about the X-37B. So Yeah, it's always funny to me when they uh, everyone says, oh, it's the super secret such and such. And I'm like, I, I feel like I could just Google this and find out stuff about it. But um, OK. Yeah. yeah. You can uh, see <laughs> it from the ground. <laughs> yeah, so no, I've exactly. watched the X-37 pass over LA a couple times. That's so, interesting. Yeah, you can look up footage of all of the four previous landings of the X-37B mm -hmm. so far. I mean, it's not, I mean, what they're doing and, and what sort of experiments they take with them might be secret, at least for the previous missions. But, you know, it's mission operations and, and parameters is pretty well known, even mm -hmm. if there is some amateur astronomy that's involved in, in finding which <laughs> orbit it's in and everything right. like that. Yeah. I got to say, too, it's adorable looking. It is. Well. Really I just want to like boop its nose. Yeah, I just mean, like, compared to uh, is so, it NASA's so uh, space, space transport system, the STS uh, space shuttles, uh, it looks like a tiny little mini me version so of nice. thereof. Uh, that's kind of funny. All right, so to uh, move, transition a little bit more into more traditional news, Mr. Jared, speaking of things news, flying so. by Earth, as it were. Yes, things <laughs> just going on past and coming <laughs> up to us. Um, so you may have heard that on August 31st through September 1st, an asteroid called Florence was actually going through our orbital neighborhood. What if we um, haven't heard that? Um, if you haven't heard it, now you have. Great. Um, News and, to me. Um, uh, this allowed us to study this asteroid in really great detail. And we always like to do this because Florence is a near-Earth uh, asteroid object. Mm -hmm. um, so because of that, it does sort of pose a hazard, if you will, that, that it does cross the Earth's orbit in a way that actually means that it could sometime really far away in the future actually impact the Earth. So our ancestors upon ancestors upon ancestors might come in contact with this? Is that yes. what we're saying? Yes, so because it's very far down the line, who cares? Um, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but um, <laughs> yeah. It's actually one of the greatest things I feel about uh, astronomers in general. Uh, I just, just, you know, being able to think that far in the future and mm -hmm. how, you know, 
recognize that that is going to be important yeah. down the line, and, even if it doesn't really affect us here right now. And we, we really worry about things like that. Yeah. And we worry about that for you. So you just continue and do your life. We'll stay up at night because astronomers <laughs> stay up at night. That's, what we, that's when we work. Because I'm a morning um, person, so I appreciate that. Thank so, you. Um, so Asteroid Florence was actually named after Florence Nightingale, the Aww. modern developer of, of nursing techniques, That's awesome. um, and it passed within about 7 million kilometers of the Earth. Um, now, the way that we actually got these images is that we used the 70-meter Mars antenna at the Goldstone Deep Space Communications Complex, actually here in California. Uh, we aimed that antenna at Florence, and we sent out radio waves to generate radio radar imagery. And this is what we saw from that imagery. We saw that Florence is about 4.5 kilometers wide, so that's a good, that's a good sized uh, uh, chunk of rock out in space. Also, it rotates every two hours, 24 minutes, um, which is very fast uh, for a asteroid, um, but not entirely unexpected because we actually did look at Florence um, a couple years ago during a study just using visible light, and we were able to find that it had a fast rotational rate. So this basically confirmed that the rotational rate that first study had found was actually correct. Hmm. Um, we also saw that there's a ridge actually a very sizable ridge um, on Florence. It has an impact crater on it, uh, and there's several flat areas on Florence as well. And this was a great asteroid to study. It's a near-Earth object, which means that you know it's a, it is a bit of a threat um, to us someday. But the biggest surprise from this is that Florence has two moons that are going around it, and those moons are very, very small. They're about 100 to 300 meters in size, and the reason that we have that large uncertainty between 100 to 300 meters uh, is because the resolution limit uh, of the 70 meter antenna um, at Goldstone is about 75 meters per pixel. Um, and these uh, moons, they're like one pixel across. Gotcha. So, um, so it's a little difficult um, <laughs> to actually determine their Understood. size. Exactly. Um, now the inner moon orbits Florence once every eight hours. The outer moon orbits it once every 27 hours. And Florence is actually what we consider an asteroid triple. Um, and here's some actual footage of uh, basically taking the imagery and stringing it together to make a movie out of it. Um, you could see the inner moon and outer moon oh, yeah, that's uh, moving crazy. right there, along with the rotation of Florence, which is very cool. Now, of the 16,400 known near-Earth objects, only three of them including Florence, are asteroid triples. So this is uh, this was a pretty cool discovery. So yeah. one, uh, one of three in 16,400 known objects. That's so, insane. Wow. Yes, it is. Uh, it, I, it's, 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 it's pretty cool. And I think it's so cool that like back in like the early 90s, people were like, asteroids don't have moons. Nonsense. And then Galileo flew by Ida, and it had a moon, and we went, oh, look. <laughs> Asteroids actually do have moons. And now asteroids have multiple moons. That is, so. a bit, I mean, that is kind of insane to think that there's this thing floating around that has other things floating around it. Yeah. Like, that's... It's like a it's like a little uh, like a little solar system in and itself. Yeah. But it's not a solar system. But it's in the solar system. Right. Because it's not a solar system because it's an asteroid triple. Right. Yes. Yes. So yeah, it's an asteroid system. Gonna, yes, it's system. an asteroid system. There you go. Exactly. Man, that's going to take a lot for me to wrap my head around. I'm not going to lie about that one. Uh, Citizen uh, 37182 says gravity experiment. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Actually, we can look at the moons um, that are going around at the rate and actually figure out very precisely what the mass is uh, of Florence. So that's one of the added benefits of having moons there. So mm -hmm. when you know the mass of Florence, we know the relative size. We actually know the density of Florence. So we know what it's made out of. Is it a solid rock? Is it a whole bunch of rocks that have come together? Mm -hmm. So that'll come down probably in a couple weeks. We'll uh, get a determination on something like that. So, huh. yeah. So, yeah, it really is a gravity experiment. Math you and thought science. you were joking. So. Uh, Destructor1701 <laughs> in the chat room says, what's the orbital attitude of those quote unquote moons? Oh, they're like, uh, like <laughs> literally, like the inner moon is probably about five or six kilometers above the surface of Florence. Okay. Um, and then the outer moon is probably about somewhere in the order of 40 to 45 kilometers. So, huh. yeah, but actually that's, that's, that's my best guess based on the data. Um, they, they actually don't exactly know yet because the data is still so fresh. Fresh, right. hot data. Yeah. So 
Uh, Marty the Martian is asking, uh, moonlets or dwarf moons? Uh, we'll just call them moons because we don't Satellites. want to get into this kind of a discussion sure? this early in the show. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. moons, uh, natural satellite, whatever you feel like calling it, go for it. So, All right. Yeah. All right. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's 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 a lot. Let's uh, let's keep moving. So, uh, Mike, some interesting things have happened over at NASA uh, besides the weather. Or rather, quite about to be happening. About, yeah, a lot of things about to be interesting happen to me uh, at NASA yeah. besides the weather. Uh, why don't you go ahead and fill, right. fill us in on that? What we're talking about is last week, uh, the White House officially appointed uh, their nominee for the next NASA administrator. Mm -hmm. And that NASA next NASA administrator that the White House wants is Representative Jim Bridenstine, the representative from Oklahoma. Now, this doesn't come as much as a surprise as Trump has mentioned it a couple of times, and Bridenstine himself has expressed his desire and willingness to serve in the position publicly. And during his time in Congress, Bridenstine has made himself an expert on space issues. He's been sponsoring or co-sponsoring a number of bills focused on NASA and improving commercial space especially. He's a big fan of commercial space. And he's also a supporter of returning astronauts to the moon first before sending them off to Mars, but still to send them to Mars. Now, uh, Bridenstine is also a member of the House Armed Services Committee and also the House Committee on Science, Space, and Technology. And he also serves on the Space and Energy Subcommittee. So he helps to, to decide the budgets. Um, now, something else that's really cool about him is he's also served nine years active duty in the United States Navy as a naval aviator. And he, after he got out of the service, he's also is in the, uh, the United States Navy Reserve and is currently in the Oklahoma Air National Guard as well. Now, despite some of his qualifications and a bunch of endorsements that he's gotten in support uh, from space companies and organizations, there's still a couple problems with his nomination. First off, it's highly unusual to have a serving politician of his level to serve as NASA administrator, since both a NASA administrator and a state representative are full-time jobs. Mm -hmm. But this is not the first time that a politician has been picked for the job. Since he's still a Republican a representative, though, and since his term ends next year, if he does become the next NASA administrator, my question is whether or not they're going to hold a special or an early election to replace his Oklahoma representative position, or if he would try to do both at the same time, and that I would have a problem with. Now, uh, Florida's two senators, uh, senators, Marco Rubio and Bill Nelson, Marco Rubio's there on the left and Bill Nelson, a former astronaut, is there on the right, uh, they share those concerns about this nomination. And they've also brought up other concerns as well. They're worried that since Bridenstein is a very strong Trump supporter and is a climate change denier, Although he's made some concessions over the years about, you know, that there are certain greenhouse gases that are having an effect on our climate, um, they're worried, Rubio and, and, and Nelson are worried that Bridenstine may hold up NASA programs based on, you know, uh, party partisanship or political arguments, past votes on, on previous bills, or even past statements like the one that Bridenstine has made denying that climate change or, or global warming is real. And about that, uh, <laughs> Even despite those things, based on Bridenstine's uh, Space Renaissance, Renaissance Act, I am confident that if he does get the job, he would still try to do the best that he could in, in, in the office. And he is a big supporter of commercial space. Um, whether or not you know climate research or, or whether or not he's a climate change denier, if you would want to shift those programs over to the NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, mm -hmm. I, I don't know. But as far as the space industry as a whole, I feel like he's a space fan. And he is on the side of moving NASA's mission forward. So I just hope for the best. Um, but yeah. Oh, yeah. And before he uh, can even become NASA administrator, his uh, nomination needs to, of course, be approved by the Senate. So if Rubio and Nelson uh, get other people to have the same sort of concerns, this may or may not happen. But we'll see. All right. Yeah. I mean, that's interesting. Uh, it's, uh, you know, all we can do really is hope for the best at this point. Uh, of mm -hmm. course, you know, get out there and vote for the people who believe in the same things that you believe in, of course. Uh, but it, it, in a weird way, space has somehow uh, come into vogue. So if we have anything going for us, uh, it's been really, really popular as of late for all parties, it seemingly set, uh, feels, to uh, move on to outside of this 
planet, if that makes any sense, onto the moon, onto Mars, or something along those lines. So uh, we can at least be yeah. excited about that part. How's that? Mm -hmm. um, and I feel right. like whatever the pol politics might be, that they would come to that same consensus. Yeah. No matter what happens, that we're still going to be moving forward in a really cool way. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> that's something to look forward to. Mr. Jared. Yes. When we get to Mars. Yes. Is this something we're going to have to deal with? Uh, no, actually, not particularly. Right. It's not. It's not is. Um, as dangerous as it sounds, but right. it is it is just a cool result that came from curiosity. Just to remind you, you know, we do have a, a car-sized rover on Mars that's been there for about five years, and it's actually found something that's very critical um, to the development of the blueprints for life, and we found it on Mars, nice. a, a place that we have suspected um, may have potentially had life on it. Um, so Curiosity, you know, still roving around on the surface of Mars, it's got this instrument called ChemCam, which up on top of the mast there, it's that circular uh, little opening. Um, the ChemCam basically fires a laser at a target, be it a uh, regolith or a rock on the surface of Mars and it analyzes uh, the gases that's coming off of that there. Um, now uh, w what's so interesting um, about this result that it got from analyzing some of the gas coming off the rocks is that we found boron on the surface of Mars. Um, now you may have heard of something called ribonucleic acid which is better known as RNA. Um, and that's actually a critical component for life. That's sort of like a nice starter uh, for life and it eventually leads to things like deoxyribonucleic acid, DNA, like what uh, most of us on this planet use. I was gonna say, it, this is probably so. the one time that a uh, three letter acronym <laughs> means something more to me than the, wit, the exploded version of it. Yes, okay. exactly. <laughs> Sorry. Um, no, it's all good. <laughs> um, so uh, <laughs> what's so cool is that uh, Ribose, the sugar, by itself is very unstable. It's when boron gets added to ribose that we get the stability um, to form the backbone of RNA molecules. Um, so the boron that was discovered at Gale Crater uh, actually uh, was in veins of calcium sulfate. This means that the water on the surface of Mars had boron in it. This uh, indicates to us that there were temperatures uh, in that water that ranged from about zero degrees Celsius to 60 degrees Celsius roughly in a pH level uh, that was ranged anywhere from you know neutral about seven to slightly alkaline somewhere at eight and nine um, in that area. Um, now Curiosity landed in 2012 and was sent to specifically prove that habitable environments on Mars exist and it's or existed, uh, excuse me on that. Mm -hmm. And it's done a great job of showing that that's absolutely true. Hmm. Um, not only was there water there, but the environments on Mars, you life could have actually flourished in those environments. Um, now, the next rover, which is currently called Mars 2020, very good name mm -hmm. uh, there, it's gonna build on the work that Curiosity has done and it's going to include an instrument that is known as Sherlock, mm -hmm. which stands for Scanning Habitable Environments with Ramen and Luminescence for Organics and Chemicals. And that's a backronym if I've ever seen one. That's such a great backronym. So Sherlock is basically an upgraded version of ChemCam and it's going to have the ability not to search for life directly mm -hmm. itself, but it's going to have the ability to search for organics and minerals that would be indicators of past life having been on Mars. So uh, this ChemCam instrument is going to get an upgrade. It's not going to find life directly, but it's going to find sort of like the leftovers of what life may have left behind. So. Uh, a very exciting result that Curiosity is still doing on the surface of Mars and also getting a little hype uh, for the upcoming instrument that's going to be on Mars 2020 based on these results. So very cool stuff. Very, very cool. Mm -hmm. Awesome. That's really exciting. All right. So that about does it for news at the moment. If you are watching live, we're actually going to do a little bit more news in After Dark because these guys got really excited and they just happened to prepare more stories for us, which is really cool. Right now, though, particularly if you're watching live or on demand, we're going to be taking a break. And when we come back, Jared is going to be uh, conducting an interview with Stuart Money talking about the history of SpaceX. So stay with us. We'll be right back. Look into her face that to my nation in her eyes. She won't give up a quit or for a little fashion lies. Films on some expectation. This girl's a fascination.
Hello and welcome back to Tomorrow. Now, before we get into our interview segment of the show, I first want to thank our Patreon supporters. These folks are our Escape Velocity variety. They give us $10 or more per episode, and they get their name in the show. A whole bunch of really nice things that you should really go to, over to patreon.com slash tmro to see. Um, but in addition to those nice things and their name in the show, we also have our Orbital members. Uh, these folks give us anywhere from $5 to $9.99. They get their name in the show twice. Uh, they get access to Patreon-only hangouts, early access to After Dark. They get to see a rundown of our show that we're working on. Get to see that in real time. So uh, also voting rights as well in, with upcoming uh, uh, round table discussions and other things that we may have. And if you would like to help crowdfund the shows of tomorrow, head on over to patreon.com slash TMRO. Now we have got a very exciting episode. This is something that we usually do not do on tomorrow because we are usually squarely focused on the future, um, as our name suggests. Uh, but we are going to talk a little history today, a uh, history about a company that you may have heard of. Um, they're called SpaceX, small company down in Hawthorne here in the Southern California area. And I've got Stuart Money, who is the founder and CEO of Innerspace.net. Also, something I definitely want to talk about, the Innerspace Brewing Company. And Stuart, you've written a book called Here Be Dragons, The Rise of SpaceX and the Journey to Mars. Stuart, welcome to tomorrow. Oh, thanks for having me. All right, so why don't we just get right into it? Uh, since we're going to be talking about the history with SpaceX, and this is a, a very complex um, and very uh, uh, almost, I want to call cinematic uh, kind of uh, history to this company, um, let's go right to, right to the beginning, right to the genesis uh, with it, Stuart. Uh, where, where do we begin when we start talking about the history of SpaceX? Well, for me, the beginning actually was the end of the shuttle program. I had gone down to see the last three launches of the shuttles. And in talking to the folks who were in those traffic jams, which were unreal there, I was really surprised at the extent to which people that took the trouble to go watch a shuttle launch thought that the American space program was ending. Um, and, and I knew it was not, that there was a, a great new chapter starting. So it seemed like a great opportunity to, to put together a book to track the history of SpaceX, which is, it was already several several years going, obviously, at that point. And that's, that's how it started. So um, with, with the start, uh, to, to specifically after um, the shuttle program, what was, uh, what was sort of the concept of SpaceX's role during that time? Well, it's a good question. I, I mean, you could almost look at, at SpaceX as, as pre-shuttle and, and post. I, I mean, I don't think they see it that way, but the everything was kind of contingent on the COTS award, the, the beginning of the, the commercial orbital transportation program. And that's what allowed SpaceX, which had been uh, still at that point unsuccessfully launching the Falcon 1, to really get a foothold and a number of launch orders to, to put the Falcon 9 into production and actually get it on the pad and start on the history that I think everyone's a lot more familiar with today. So let's let's talk a little bit about the Falcon One because there's SpaceX has brought a lot of space fans um, into the discussion, which is fantastic. Um, but there's also a lot of space fans who don't know uh, partic the particulars about those very early days um, at SpaceX. So um, what 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 specifically was the the Falcon One program and what came out of that? Well, it was their first attempt to, to have a, a launch vehicle, and they targeted the Orbital Sciences Pegasus rocket as, as the competition, which was the leading small launch vehicle at the time, domestic. And it was uh, actually an attempt to make the history's first, re, uh, not reusable, though they did try reuse with that. You see a lot of SpaceX's current efforts and, and what they've accomplished, the, the genesis of it in the Falcon 1 program. So this was just going to be the first liquid-fueled rocket commercially developed to achieve orbit. And I think the thing a lot of people maybe don't see today is just what a hard road it was for them at that point in time. They, you know, they suffered three failed launches uh, and really got down to the last bit of money, the last effort for a fourth launch. And I think thankfully for all of us, that, that ended up being successful. And there was only one more launch after that, and then that was it for the, for the 
Falcon 1. It's a, it's a great little rocket that, that, that really got them in a position to do great things later on. And, and I think a lot of folks that, that are just, you know, just amazed at what they're doing today realize it was not all that long ago that these guys were still way out in the Pacific trying their darndest to, to get one little rocket into orbit. Yeah, and uh, that that one little rocket um, was going to be turned into another rocket known as the Falcon One E. And um, correct. And um, can you can you kind of talk a little bit about what happened to Falcon One E? Um, because there there had been there were payloads for it, but um, like Formostat Five, which was just launched, but that got moved to Falcon Nine. So what what exactly happened with Falcon One E? So what SpaceX did was when they got the COTS award um, and were able to shift gears, they really focused everything on, on the Falcon 9. So the, the 1E, I think, was something that drug out there a little bit. They've they come out and said definitively, this is why we dropped it. But I think what you see in the decision to do it is something that is uh, truly a hallmark of SpaceX, is they will announce a great plan, um, a, an exciting plan, but they are not hesitant to drop that plan and change it if circumstances dictate. So once they were in a better position with the, with the Falcon 9, and don't forget there was Falcon 5 and the Falcon 5 Strata Launch variant also that, that went by the wayside. Um, they didn't get as far as Falcon 1. And um, it, it's, a, it's a, an interesting aspect of the company that that's such a, uh, a part of their approach is they'll dig in and then they will, they will change horses midstream if, if Logic and economics dictates they do it. So how does that uh, that flexibility of being able to to drop uh, a program compared to say like a, any other commercial company when they drop a program? Is there real flexibility to that with SpaceX? Um, you know, actually being able to basically say this isn't going to work, so we're not going to keep doing it. It's probably a reflection of changing markets as much as anything. Uh, going from the, a very small satellite launch market which at the time was, was, was quite iffy. Um, it, it's certainly gotten a lot better. I mean, you see so much development right now in the same market, the same class that the Falcon 1 would have been in. Um, and I'm sure some people wonder, hey, why not get back in that? But the goal has always been on Mars. The goal has been on taking steps to get there to iterative improvement of whatever is the, the most important product at that point in time. I'm sure if the market had been as strong five, six years ago as it is now, perhaps they would have stayed in it. Um, but they also do a very good job of keeping their eye on what their goal is and not letting um, distractions, uh, even if it's something that, that, that is of their own making, get in the way of, of staying focused where they need to be focused. So we've got, so we have Fal the Falcon 1 program, which was troubled, but a very, I don't necessarily want to say troubled in a negative sense. Um, oh, not at all. Not it, at it, all. Was, it, was it was specifically for trial and error um, to make sure that things worked uh, correctly. Um, and then Falcon 1E and Falcon 5, which eventually were sort of tossed because that, you know, it was, nothing was there to dictate a need for it at the moment. Um, it was Falcon 9, which was the next rocket developed, was that always something that had been around since the beginning, the formations of SpaceX? Or was that basically looking at the Falcon 1 program and going, we need to go a little bit bigger than this? Well, they went from, from 1 to announcing Falcon 5 and then, then on to Falcon 9. I, I think it's fair to say that their goal was always on, on um, bigger and bigger and, and still is on bigger. So they may not, may not have thought of it as Falcon 9 at the very beginning, but they were going to go where the facts led and where the market and the scale of production led. So it, it sort of led to Falcon 9, and what's fascinating is, is even in you know launch you saw this week, it's powered by a Merlin engine, which is, which is quite a bit more powerful than that very first one um, on the Falcon 1 launch, which was an, um, an ablative thrust chamber, you know, of all things, but it still is a direct line of uh, improvements going from where they were to where they are, and I, I think that's one of the most amazing aspects. And uh, Astro YYZ from our chat room has a question that I kind of want to I want to take and I want to add on a little bit to it for anyone who's watching um, who may not understand why the Falcon rockets are named Falcon and why they ha specifically have a number at the end of their name. Can you explain that for us? 
Sure. Well, the, the the Falcon series was named after the Millennium Falcon from from Star Wars. It's pretty <laughs> pretty pr- pretty simple on that one. And, and as far as the number, it, it's referred to the number of engines. So you had the Falcon One, five was going to be a Falcon with five engines, and then actually it was going to be for, briefly a Falcon Nine with four engines removed un, under one of the later versions of of that proposed booster. And then you've got, of course, the Falcon. Nine. Now, fortunately, with um, with Falcon Heavy, they they got rid of that set of nomenclature because Falcon, what twenty seven, would be a little bit of a a challenge. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, a, a significant difference um, in in payload um, would definitely have sort of thrown people off uh, for Falcon twenty seven. Uh, plus, I suppose the nomenclature is already established since you have a Delta four Heavy, which is three cores strapped together so might as well just stick with what everybody's doing Um, absolutely yeah why reinvent the core i suppose um (laughs) with that there so um let's let's switch gears a little bit we'll come back to rockets um because i do want to talk about some of the 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 evolution of the falcon 9 to where it is today um and also we do want to talk about falcon heavy because that's on everybody's minds um right now but i want to talk a little bit about dragon um because uh you know there's a lot. There are quite a few rocket companies out there, um, but there are a very small number of rocket companies that I know that have their own spacecraft that they put on top of their rocket. Um, so tell us a little bit about uh, the the history of Dragon, going all the way. You know, when from the conception of Dragon to to where it is. Well, that, that's a great question because there was we're all familiar with with. Dragon as it is now, and pretty soon it'll be Dragon 2 um, as they're moving into commercial crew. But it really dates back, and, and I, I forget the name, but a proposal from a, a British guy regarding a, a very, um, very small capsule crew that would have gone on the Falcon 5. Um, and I believe there ended up being ITAR issues involved with it. I don't know how, <laughs> how directly, uh, how serious Elon Musk ever was about that. But it was, um, it, it's got its origins, and I do cover this in the book, it's got its origins in a um, kind of a curious little proposal. I think a boilerplate capsule was, was shipped to the U.S. from, from it maybe been sent to uh, El Segundo. It was, it was so far back in SpaceX's history. I, somebody could correct me on that. But um, it, it's gone through, I, I wouldn't count that as an iteration, but like with everything that the, they tend to do, the, the, the very first Dragon, has been a series of, of improvements. So now we're coming up on Dragon Two, but it it's um, it incorporates so much of, of what happened in the early series. And of course, one of the most important things has been the, the the heat shield, the the progressive improvement and series of generations on the heat shield. Again, going back to that that really driving goal for SpaceX, which is which is Mars. So I just want to take a. Uh, a- question from the chat room that's related to some recent developments um, about Dragon, uh, which Space Geek is asking, why did Dragon fail its test recently f- to not be landing under power anymore? Do you kind of have any clues as to um, why the, the original concept of propulsive landings kind of been put, you know, no pun intended, on the back burner at the moment? That is, it's it, it also a good question. I don't have any specific knowledge, but but what I, I do think they run into was the realization that it was going to take a lot more effort to qualify that safely to make NASA happy. Um, and then going back to that willingness to change gears, if, it, if something no longer makes sense and switch directions, they, they rapidly reached the conclusion that um, maybe this is not worth the time and the effort um, to do it. Uh, maybe they'll come back to it. But I also think it has a lot to do with with uh, what Elon had said recently regarding a, a kind of a rethink on how they want to land on Mars, um, you know, not going with the side side mounted thrusters and the landing. Mm-hmm. So I, yeah, and if I remember, that's about all I got on that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, there's there's honestly not much information out there about that. Um, I guess stay tuned for the IAC presentation um, at the end of this month. Hopefully, um, we'll yeah. find out some more there. Um, so I want to go back um, to talk about Falcon 9, um, because one of the most interesting things about Falcon 9 to me is that unlike um, some 
co rocket companies out there, SpaceX has actually been making incremental upgrades um, to Falcon 9 as it, as it, as it flies. Um, and I, I cannot recall any other company doing that um, with a rocket. And that could just be a failing exactly. of, my, of my memory itself. Um, but I, I legitimately cannot recall hearing about l literal upgrades to rockets as things have progressed in the, at least the past 10 to 15 years. So I think, I mean, it's a, it's a great point in, in that um, the goal on, on almost every launch vehicle creator or builder designer is to get a successful design and then freeze it. Uh, do whatever you can to not make changes. And sometimes you see designs kind of downscaled a bit. Um, you know, somebody will get a little bit nervous that, that maybe this strut doesn't have enough, enough metal in it and, and they'll, they'll actually reduce, in effect, reduce the performance slightly. You know, there, there was a, obviously an era early at Cape Canaveral where it was a, a series of just, just iterative improvements. But in what you might call the commercial space age, you know, dating back to the introduction of, of Arion, it, it's, it's get design, make sure it's reliable, and then freeze it. And make sure you keep doing what you're doing. Wear your lucky socks or, or whatever you got to do. And that SpaceX is, just has had a different goal in mind. And, and that... Yeah, I hate to sound like a broken record here, but it comes back and, and, <laughs> and really drives the way they approach. Now, I think that they do have to freeze the, the Falcon 9 in the Block 5 configuration for commercial crew because NASA is not, uh, is not probably all that keen on the idea of continuing to tinker with a vehicle that, that's got um, its astronauts aboard it. Yeah, and just to kind of go back to the point I made where I said um, I couldn't think of any rockets that have been upgraded incrementally. Um, our chat room, of course, very smart, very knowledgeable people in there. Um, Space Mike uh, let me know that ro Russians upgrade their rockets all the time, which that, that is true. They, they swap out avionics and, and engines and things like that. And Loopy um, in our chat room also reminds me that the RS-25 the space shuttle main engine um, was upgraded as well throughout the program. So, uh, yeah, so it's, it's, it's just very cool to see, I guess, a, uh, a commercial company um, deciding to, to put the effort um, into the, uh, the upgrades uh, with it there. So um, to, I, I kind of want to talk a little bit about the interplanetary transport system uh, as well, which uh, was at least publicly announced uh, last year um, and uh, and going to be going through uh, modifications apparently that we'll find out at IAC um, but can you tell us a little bit about the interplanetary transport system and kind of how it uh, goes in line with SpaceX's ultimate goal? Well I may disappoint you a bit on this one I hadn't um, filed it probably as closely as most of the people in your chat room having cut the uh, the, the book off at the end of the CRS-2 mission, for the most part. But uh, it obviously, it's, it's going to be, the design's going to be changed, or, or it looks like downscaled, right, um, mm -hmm. at the next, next discussion of it. Uh, maybe the outer ring of engines removed. I think, um, and this is just, just supposition, um, is that perhaps Elon has been looking at what Jeff Bezos is doing, what he's planning, and really kind of matching sizes a little bit more with the uh, with uh, having the, the earth moon space sort of insights not not say Mars is, is going to ever slip out of view but it seems like like maybe there's there's a little bit more motivation for seeking a wider customer base than um, people re ready to move to Mars on, on the on the first pass mm-hmm yeah, it goes it goes back to the sort of the, from the right stuff, you know, no bucks, no buck Rogers. I guess if you exactly if you can't make the money, you can't fund it. Um, so you did mention um, that your book goes to uh, CRS2. Um, and I kind of want to I do want to we're jumping all over the timeline um, right. here in terms of <laughs> history with SpaceX. Um, and I kind of want to go back and talk about um, the the. Uh, both COTS Demo Flight 1 and uh, Dragon C2 Plus. Um, so COTS Demo Flight 1, for those who are watching, um, basically launched a Dragon into space, into orbit and around. And uh, just how important was that, uh, that mission to SpaceX? Oh, it was, it was amazingly important. So they were, this was the first, you know, flight under COTS program for SpaceX, the very first flight of Falcon 9 
was not. So, but this was a flight where you think about it, this is a company that is, is still coming off this string of not totally successful flights um, with the Falcon 1. They're into their second launch and they bring back a, a you know, a, a spacecraft, which is, it had a wheel of cheese on board, right? But uh, the comment at the end of it was, was, you know, had, you know, there been crew, they would have had a comfortable ride. Probably would have been starved for oxygen by the time they got back, but um, <laughs> perhaps they would have been full. Who, you know, who knows? But in terms of a sweeping technological accomplishment, I, I, I you know, we're now so used to, to, to Dragon, um, you know, going up and coming back that it, it's, it's hard to imagine that this was just, just really a few short years ago that there was the first company ever was bringing, um, was bringing a, a capsule back from orbit and successfully landing it. And, and they've been, you know, phenomenal at this. A little bit of a learning curve on some seawater intrusion issues, I think. But mm -hmm. uh, a very, very important flight. And, of course, it, it helped set the, the stage for the, the COTS-2-3 mission and, and the first you know, test run to ISS. Yeah, and how about that COTS-2 mission? Because that was basically the first, I, I want to say, uh, is it fair to say it was the first commercially developed spacecraft to go to the space station? Or, or would we word that a little bit differently um, than, than that? I'm, I'm sure probably somebody would want to pick a nit with that, with that <laughs> but I think from... From any rational consideration, you know, were there were there public dollars involved? Well, you know, of course there were, uh, but it was still done by a commercial company under a design that was that company's, not dictated uh, by NASA. They, NASA certainly dictated the safety protocols, the um, and obviously the, the the birthing mechanisms and everything was was government uh, paid for, developed hardware. But it's I, I would certainly give it credit for that. And I'd, I'd go as far as to say that the COTS-2-3 mission was one of, uh, of the most significant events in the space age, number one, and certainly in the commercial space age. Mm -hmm. I, I, it, to me, it kicked off the new space age um, in, in, a, in a real way. I mean, this was, you got to remember, at the time that this was going, you had U.S. senators that were still just slamming SpaceX uh, every, every chance they could. Um, and sometimes their congratulations weren't uh, following too quickly after this thing, but there was a lot on the on the line. And this was this was what right after, not too long after the closeout of of shuttle. And so you know you got the nation not really paying attention. I, I remember the the not, I was fortunate enough to 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 be able to attend that launch and the, the the night before there was nothing happening on on uh, you know in Titusville right in, right in front of you know across the. The river there, looking at stuff. There was just no sense driving out to to um, Kennedy that morning that that anything big was going on. And I was like, oh my goodness, the world is about to change. Hopefully, you know, if it's successful, and you know, the rest of the world's just sleeping. But it's 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 changed now. Yeah, and I remember uh, watching uh, the C two plus uh, the first launch attempt when they they aborted half a second. Uh, before and I remember th a lot of people were like, "Ah, oh, look at this little private company. They have no idea what they're doing." Um, but everybody, at least in engineering circles, was going, "Wow, they they are fairly mature because they caught a problem just before liftoff, and that's that's a very good sign." Um, and then three days later, actually, you know, launching a Dragon to the space station for the first time uh, with that there. Yeah, it, it a remarkable sequence of events um, in, in a short period of time. And it was, it was amazing just to, to see it take place. Yeah, and then after the uh, COTS Demo 2, we had the first official commercial resupply mission, CRS-1. Um, and that also was quite a game changer as well. Well, it, it was. So it was the, the official beginning of the CRS program. There was a little bit of... Um, Cargo that was loaded onto the onto the the CRS. I always call it the the two three mission. Um, but then <laughs> then you start actually. I mean, if you think about it in context, this was now. I mean, it was it was great for SpaceX. It was phenomenal for you know people that watch them around the world. But it was also phenomenal for NASA because the, you have this, this this enormous investment in the space station up there. It's now been completed. It's time to start doing the science. Um, and, and they got to have the science get up, and, and more importantly, they got to have the science get back. And you, you've got other people supplying stations at that point in time. 
you've got the a ATV, the HTV, you, um, you know, orbital ATK is, is, is well, they want orbital a ATK at that point, but orbital is, is going to be following soon. But SpaceX is the only one that can bring any meaningful amount of experiments back down to Earth. So it was, it was, it was critical in that regard. And it really kind of kicked off. Um, I mean, NASA talks about the, the extent to which having the ability to get up and get back increases the pace of science, um, allows them to actually make use of, of the time that is available, up, you know, up there on this magnificent facility. So it was, and of course, that was also a mission that had its own uh, excitement. If, if my memory is correct, that was the one where the where uh, you had an engine shut down uh, mm -hmm. during during launch. The, the number one engine, you had a, um, I believe, a chamber breach, and it shut down and it, it threw off of uh, it's, it's the you know back in those days the the Falcon Nine had the flared fairings from, you know at the base of the engine, you know, no legs or anything at that point. Um, and so, so we all saw that fly off, and you're like, oh my goodness, what happened? And, you know, it just kept going. All, mm -hmm. all of the, the discussion leading up before that, Elon's discussion of, of hey, it's, you know, here is the, the logic behind a multiple people had, had denigrated, you know, this, oh, look at you, you've got these little engines. I mean, you got to take nine of them just to, just to do what we can do with our, you know, one big. Well, it worked. I mean, it, it's, thank goodness it did. Um, but, and that could have been another one of these, these inflection points where if it hadn't done, it was supposed to do, but it did. And, and that was um, really kind of kicked off the <laughs> the uh, the CRS missions with probably a little bit more excitement than than SpaceX wanted to have at that time. <laughs> yes, I do recall um, that was the first time I ever heard the phrase "rapid unintended disassembly." Um, mm -hmm. So good phrasing, guys. Um, <laughs> with that there, so um, and then uh, of course after CRS one came CRS two, which is uh, which is where the book. Um, that you've written ends at, um, and you know uh, to do it a second time, it's just as important to do it the first time. Um, and if I remember correctly, there was some drama on the CRS two as well. If I remember, if I recall correctly, on that. Wait, and, and uh, you do recall correctly, and this drama actually was in a lot of ways um, a lot more exciting, uh, and not necessarily in a good way th than what happened with uh, on the CRS one because that was an engine shut down, the rocket kept going. This time they, they had the problem with initializing the uh, Draco thrusters aboard the, the, the Dragon. And I, you have these uh, series of kind of, of anxious phone calls back and forth. They got the Air Force to help establish a communications link with the Dragon. I think it was, if I remember, it was spinning. They, they, they thought early on they knew what to do to fix it, but they still had to get a strong enough signal to the spacecraft to to change the software to, to to get these valves to open up, so there was a there, and this is one that would have played out, um, you know, over a couple of days, and and you you know you could have had a dragon with an uncontrolled reentry over you know who knows where it's going to come down. It's mostly over water, right? But you, know, you never know. So this was a uh, this was this was exciting too, and I think they were very happy to for a, a time at least get get down to um, just hauling hauling stuff up and bringing stuff back. Yeah, and um, I do want to go to our chat room uh, for a question from Jason519, which is, um, since SpaceX is the most affordable launch service, um, do you foresee other providers falling aside or maybe catching up or maybe the next SpaceX emerging? In, in, ter in terms of current providers, I think a couple of things to keep in, in mind. Number one, the commercial satellite companies are never going to... Um, allow uh, the launch providers to go down to just one, no matter how cheap or how good they are. It's, it's, and, and you can see why. They're absolutely motivated. Uh, neither is the uh, U.S. Department of D Defense and National Security space. It's absolutely vital that you keep a, a, you know, what they would term assured access to space. So Aryan space is not going to go anywhere. They, I think they may not get as many commercial missions ultimately, but so far they seem to be faring just well. Um, and United Launch Alliance has, has, has made progress in, in, um, in several fronts as well. So it's, they're going to stay. It's, it's kind of the peripheral players. You know, there was Sea Launch that um, basically what, what went out of business and then the assets sold off. They want to come back. Um, but SpaceX really hurts the business case for, for others. The, the one to keep an eye on, obviously, I think is, is actually Blue Origin. 
um, and they seem to indicate they're, they don't say much, so it's hard to tell, but early indications uh, were that, that they, they were really more interested in tourism than in, in satellite delivery, but that could, of course, uh, certainly change. Mm -hmm. I have no clue on that, actually. They, they don't <laughs> say that much. Yeah, not a lot of information uh, coming out of that. Yeah. Not a lot coming out of that pipeline, unfortunately. Um, but Andrew Shire in our chat room has a really interesting question um, that I feel like is, is pretty good for posing, which is that did the Merlin engine actually play a large part in the success of SpaceX or so far, or is there, or is there something else that's really played that? Oh, it's well, I mean, there are multiple factors, but um, yeah, absolutely, Andrew, the, the, the Merlin engine, I mean, it, it is remarkable in, in that the evolution it, it has gone through. I mean, it's a completely different engine than it, than it was to begin with, but it, it actually just gave them leverage. That They needed some leverage, some aspect, and the fact that they developed the Merlin themselves, uh, taking borrowing a lot from NASA's fast track engine that was developed here at Marshall Space Flight Center, in Huntsville, um, that was sort of the, the the genesis of that engine in a lot of ways. But if they had gone out and acquired an engine from someone else, which you know perhaps could have done, could have perhaps bought a Russian engine, what would they have learned? They wouldn't have learned nearly as much as what they did. So starting um, starting early and starting um, and testing all the time, constantly testing in Texas, really kind of I, I think along with the other aspects of that Falcon 1, really help develop the engineering culture that SpaceX has now and, and their, their overall mindset, which is to continuously improve, to iterate what they've got. So I, that, you know, for a Hall of Fame of engines, there, there, you know, there are a couple that need to be in there, and, and the, 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 the Merlin is certainly one of them. I would put the RL-10 engine and, of course, the uh, Saturn F1 in there as well. I mean, there have been a lot of great engines, but it's, it's been key. Yeah, and uh, Space Geek also in our chat room has a pretty cool um, question that I want to ask as well, which is a, a particularly important question, especially considering the the overlying goal of get to Mars um, at SpaceX, which is will SpaceX ever become a public company? What do you, what do you think about that? Do you think they'll ever do that? I think uh, that's a boy. How many people ask that question? How many people? Would love to have a little little stock in SpaceX, um, <laughs> and they're gonna or, or a lot of stock in SpaceX actually. I'm sure all the the employees that have stock options would really love to have that too. Um, I guess ultimately, I would suspect so, but I, I think it may continue to be further out in the future than than anyone um, really would think it'll be. Simply because this is uh, Elon's made the point on multiple occasions. He's He's not amassing all the money through his various ventures for, for the edification of being rich. It's for following through with this dream of making a second branch human civilization on Mars. And I, logically, you would not want to lose control of, of the means to do that until, you were, until that was up and going. I would be surprised if SpaceX went public before they had landed somebody on Mars. So what's in the what's in the future for SpaceX? Do you have anything that you see in the crystal ball that uh, that may be something that some of us aren't actually looking at? Well, I, I think so. Gwen Shotwell did an interview on the Space Show back earlier this year and uh, back in June, I think. And one fascinating little question that was asked it was a big question, but it was interesting to answer to me was that that Elon had had constantly kind of downgraded the even the idea of involvement with any sort of nuclear propulsion or nuclear nuclear power source in space and for the first time the door opened up on that a, a little bit was was the way i read it but for the for the next couple of years uh, SpaceX is going to focus first and foremost on commercial crew on falcon heavy um and and dragon 2 this you know they've got the a lunar mission, uh, the private tourist mission should happen, but it's not going to happen until they've done their work for, for NASA, and they've got uh, the that you know first crew up to the station. And they're kind of in an unofficial race with with Boeing and CST, right, to mm -hmm. to get up there and, and bring back the flag that was left on the last shuttle mission. So, um, they're this is a hallmark of them, as I was saying earlier, that they. Unlike a lot of other companies, they, they espouse truly grand goals. I mean, how many other companies say we want to sell another planet, and, and that's our goal? That's their goal, but, but they also make sure, even though there's, there's a lot of, of, of 
big picture items out there, they're going to stay focused on the on what the immediate perspective is, and it would be those three things for, for the time being. Beyond that, if if whatever we see at the next iteration of um, of what do they call it now, the BFS and the BFR, right? Um, <laughs> I guess it'll depend on on what kind of capabilities it has as as it becomes as it comes to life eventually. But it, it it would appear to open up the solar system. And one final thing before we get into our our closing questions um, that we ask everybody, um, because I'm a bit of a beer fan. Um, I, I like going and uh, and trying out <laughs> brews and stuff. I've got to ask you Me about too. it because it's right behind you. And I've been staring at it this whole time and thinking about it. Um, Interspace Brewing Company. What is Interspace Brewing Company? So it is a craft brewery that uh, I and my family are opening up in Huntsville, Alabama. Um, it's like any good launch campaign. You, you may be able to read it. It says summer, uh, well, summer 2017. Summer ends uh, September 21st. And I, I would have loved to have met that goal. I think we'll be... <laughs> I think we'll be. Uh, I think we'll be um, in early October, and uh, probably not much later than that. But it, it really is a combination of two things I love: uh, beer uh, and space. We really would like to create a, a, an environment. Huntsville is a phenomenal city for this. I mean, so much going on. It, it's going to land in Huntsville, and, you know, ultimately once it makes its first trip to ISS. So it's a uh, it's a great history here. Um, it's a great culture, a great beer culture. So this was an opportunity to, to, to take a love of craft beer and actually just in our tap room and in uh, some of the other aspects incorporate space, uh, both, both historical, future space, and, and sci-fi as well. Well, I hope I can swing by one day and hopefully you guys oh, have please a do. Space Dust IPA on tap because that's it, some good stuff. Yeah. So I probably won't have that one on tap. <laughs> bring a couple thousand people with you when you come. <laughs> sounds good. I, sounds like a deal. You get me a beer, I'll get you a couple thousand people. There all you right. go. So uh, we've got some some standard questions that we ask all of our guests who come on the show. Uh, there are no right or wrong answers um, to these questions. We just basically want to hear directly from you. Um, what you think. Um, take as little or as long amount of time as you'd like to, and we've got five of them. So you ready to go? I'm ready to go. Okay, here we go. Moon or Mars first? Moon. Moon, okay. Any, any particular reason why? I think that's the best opportunity to get a public-private partnership of, of the type that SpaceX and Blue Origin and whoever else, uh, ULA here in Huntsville, um, could use to, to really leverage the, the assets and, and make a, a real kind of frontal assault on Mars when it's time. Solid. All right. Uh, would you go? Absolutely. And, well, uh, wh which one, the moon or Mars? Uh, I think that's up to you. Which would would you go? Oh, I would. I would love to go to both. I mean, I, it's um, let's 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 stick with the moon now. But I, you know, I, I left out part of the answer about beer. I mean, if you think about the things as we sell Mars, you're not going to be able to do. I mean, you're not going to go probably sailing. I mean, all the outdoor things you we do here on Earth, we take for granted. Can't do it. But as long as you can drink beer, it's you know life's still not too bad. Yeah, I was gonna say if we're gonna if we're not gonna be able to take beer to space, I don't think I'm gonna be able to go. So I'm, um, I'm out. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> when do you think humans will first land on Mars? Oh, that's that's a great question. I'm I'm trying to find some sort of a promotional thing to do here tied to that that doesn't get me in trouble with the. Uh, with the uh, ABC licensing authorities. I hadn't quite figured that one out yet, but um, I, it, it'll be in the 2020s, I think. I, I, I'm, yeah. 2020s, all late right. 20, late 2020s. Late 2020s, okay, so just about a decade yeah. from now. Exactly, I'd, I'd give it about that much. Obviously, I'm betting on, on, on SpaceX doing what they say they wanna do, maybe a little later. I'll, I'll be surprised if it actually takes longer than, say, 2032 whatever launch window it is around that time frame, frankly. All right. Uh, when do you think humans will set foot on the moon again? Well, I, I gosh, um, I hope in the, in the next four, four years, four or six years, I guess. But again, that, that also requires a, a public-private partnership. Um, it's certainly not going to happen under the existing, existing program, but I, I think it'll be eight years on, realistically. Eight years. Okay, so you're thinking 2025, yeah. mid-2020s. Yeah, something like that. Okay, cool. Everything takes longer than, than people want. 
Yes, unfortunately. Um, and then my, the final and my favorite question, um, always to ask people, why space? Oh, God, for me, I, it just, why not? I mean, it, it is, I, I don't see how it's not space, frankly. I mean, it, this is, we are a, right, curious people, creatures. We, we, we have traveled and covered the entire planet. It's in our DNA to go and explore. And, and you, you look out there on, on a night and you see all this and, and the, see the moon and, and, you know, squint your eyes and see Mars when the time's right. And, and I, I just say, why not? I mean, it is just the answer is so obvious to me. I, I can't, uh, you know, if you have to ask, if you have trouble answering the question, you're, you know, I don't know. You're weird. <laughs> Oh, Stuart Money, thank you so much for coming on today. Oh, thank you uh, for having me. Founder and CEO of Interspace.net, Interspace Brewery Company, which I will be stopping by someday, um, and author of a fantastic book called Here Be Dragons, The Rise of SpaceX and the Journey to Mars. Stuart, thanks for coming on tomorrow. Absolutely. Thank you very much. It was, it was a lot of fun. All right. And coming up, your comments are in our next segment right after this break. So stay tuned. There's more tomorrow in just a little bit. We've always looked to the stars. They guide us, give us comfort, help us find our way. We see ourselves out there. When we look up, it inspires us. And we long for something we don't yet know. We yearn to go there. So, we venture forth. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. The exploration of space will go ahead whether we join in it or not. Many think we stopped exploring. But we know our journey didn't end. We've only just begun. Orion is functioning perfectly at this point. Come with us and explore tomorrow. Thank you for joining our conversation. Thank you for having that interview, Jared. That Thank was you. really good. Thank you to Stuart. It's uh, such, such great information. From yeah, that, so. totally. Totally, and I didn't, I didn't mind them bouncing around. I thought that was good. Uh, and thank you, Mike, for coming back, of course, and joining us for this segment. And thank you, of course, to our Patreon supporters. These are the Escape Velocity variety. These have given us $10 or more. They, of course, get their name in the show again and a slew of things. We also want to thank our Orbital members. These are people who have given us $5 or more. As Jared explained, uh, they get the free the swag store stuff and a whole bunch of other things. And then, of course, our Suborbital members. These are the $2.50 and more they get their name in the show there you go early access to after dark uh the uh, of course the i like the also the copy of the show rundown uh, the view only copy of the show rundown so you can kind of see all the craziness as it happens and of course free shipping and our tomorrow swag store as well uh, if you are also interested in any of these things and more that we did not mention head on over to patreon.com slash tmro Oh my goodness. All right, so w this segment we're talking about, uh, yeah, yeah, as you saw there, a little flash of Dave. Uh, we're talking about comments and questions, concerns, complaints that you had about our previous show uh, or anything going forward. We, of course, were speaking with Dave Mastin of Mastin Space Systems last week. If you missed that one, it's another great conversation with Dave and Ben, uh, you know, Dave's dreamy, dreamy eyes that uh, Ben just cannot resist. Uh, and uh, we actually he's not the only one that can't resist him. This is true. Hello. This is very true. Uh, and a little bit, of, we got into 3D printing uh, a little bit with Dave last week, which was really interesting. I and thought. a lot of ITAR redacted. A lot of like things just 
Dave was like, yeah, I'm not going to comment on that. I'm like, <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Moving on, I guess. Uh, so, <laughs> so, so good. Uh, okay, so <laughs> in regards to that particular show and other things, uh, I, we are going to get into some of those comments. Uh, let's see. So the first one comes from Patreon, actually, from Grubby. Grubb-b-b-b-b? Grubb-b-b-b? Grubb-b-b-b? Grubbery. Yeah, right? I okay. don't know. <laughs> it says, uh, for the regular people that you claim to be, uh, I guess that would be me, uh, I just want to say how much I appreciate the depth you bring to the topics on the show. This is a shout out for all the work that happens before the cameras even roll. Uh, thank you. Thank, thank you, thank you very, very much. Uh, there is definitely a lot of work that goes into this. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, anyone who is at the 250 and above who can see the rundown and all of the craziness when it happens, as it happens, uh, <sighs> sometimes things literally come together last second, last minute. Um, and and, so, and then so. for all of you who have watched for a couple of weeks in a row now, we, we've had a couple of fun, interesting things where we say, and next week we're going to have so-and-so on, and then we don't. Uh, there's always something, some things, uh, interesting things that happen there as well. So, uh, thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, that of course comes with, uh, a lot of grace, uh, a lot of patience and uh, a lot of trial and error on our part. We've been doing this for a little bit of a while so, now. Yeah. So there's that. And, uh, our fearless leader, Ben always manages to uh, weather the storm for us like that. So mm -hmm. that's, uh, we we appreciate that you appreciate us. How's that, for instance? Without you Thank guys, you. Uh, this wouldn't be possible anyway. We would just be sitting in an empty room talking to each other, which we do anyhow. I mean, we're friends, so so there's that part yeah. of it. But it's, it's nice to be able to share the conversation with you as well. So thank you for that opportunity. Uh, next comment uh, comes off of Patreon as well, actually from X Arrow, mm -hmm. saying, introduce a new mini segment of the show, the Mastin Moment. I like that idea. Each week, share a tidbit from Dave Mastin, like a photo of their launch or landing mount or details of, on Broadsword, etc. You know you want to. Oh, yeah, we definitely want to. Uh, yeah, I would, yeah, we definitely want to. Uh, but as you can see, we barely got a, uh, an interview with him this last week. Uh, Dave yeah. was so unable to, to say things as it were. Uh, and if it's me, I still can't hear Mike. So there's that. Uh, hopefully Mike's not saying anything, just smiling and nodding and agreeing as he usually does anyhow, uh, which is really fantastic. <laughs> nope, I guess. Oh, poor Mike. <laughs> oh, no. No, nothing. <laughs> I don't know what's going on, but we'll figure that out in a second as we go on. Uh, uh, right? I mean, I think a Mastin moment would be... It'd be beautiful. Hilarious on so, so many different... Uh, I just want to, like like have like us ask like a three to four long paragraph question about something ultra specific. Right. And then Dave just goes, uh, I can't talk about that. Right. And that's your Mastin moment for this week. That was, I mean, that was part of the, uh, the sort of, like I said, like we've had a couple of things where we were saying, hey, so-and-so is going to be on and then so-and-so can't be on for whatever reason. Uh, you know, things happen. Of course, weather happens. We have hurricanes. We have tornadoes. We have fire uh, on a lot of the part of the country right now. Yeah. Uh, so all of those sorts of things happen and then guests are unable to, to be on, which, you know, uh, that happens. And so Dave kind of pitched hit for us and he didn't get the okay to say all of the things that he may have wanted to say mm -hmm. and uh we just figured it out so that's fine it's, it's i okay. mean that's aerospace for you so that's can't just talk about everything unfortunately yeah so. yeah unfortunately unfortunately yeah. but uh so there's that so okay so the next comment uh actually comes off of facebook it's really great that you guys are commenting on just about anywhere and everywhere that you want to comment on so and we do read them all i promise it's just uh trying to you know get down to the few five or six that we really really like and want to focus on can sometimes uh be a, a challenge but this one comes from david Connolly. says what was the isro launch vid video sped up it looks like it left the launch platform really quickly uh i you know uh, ironically this would be a little bit more of a mic toss but we you and i can discuss that <laughs> oh, <laughs> i just heard mike now i yes, did we can. hear a mic you guys hear me now i can can you hear us I can. So um, actually with that video, that was the actual speed. I did not speed up the video for that uh, when we showed that. And so, yeah, that's the actual speed. And that's a combination of the liquid and solid rockets that they use for that. That's why it lifts off the pads so quickly Yep. for the PSLV rocket. 
Right. I mean, there are some times where you do uh, have to sort of condense uh, the the video a bit and sort of speed it up. Uh, sometimes when uh, things are docking with the International Space Station, I know some of those videos are a little bit sped up. But yeah, that one in particular, that was yeah. that's just the way that goes. Yeah. Yeah, dockings and EVAs. I mean, we don't have time to watch a 15-minute video for something that I can just, you know, compress for that. And I apologize if there is anyone who doesn't like that 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 we might do that, but just kind of more in the effort of time, you know, is is I do that for the really slow type of videos where you have to have these very slow maneuvers so that you don't bump into anything or have any problems. But but yeah, I usually don't up uh, 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 speed up launch videos. I do speed up sometimes the SpaceX landing videos, like uh, w like this week where we got the entire footage, you know, from yeah. uh, second stage separation all the way down to the ground. I did speed that up a bit, just in the sake of time. But I think that you might have been able to tell where it, it returns to normal speed. So yeah, as uh, CoGen Seven in the in the chat room says, today's footage of the Falcon Nine landing was sped up. Uh, that launch was not though. When solids go. Solids go. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, they just, uh, yep. that's, that's both the best part about solids and the worst part about solids because there's no real shutting them off. Yeah. They yep. just sort of. You're committed. Go forever. <laughs> uh, that's hilarious. Um, did you, was there anything else that we missed that you wanted to comment on the other two comments just uh, while we can actually hear you now? Oh, um, I just, uh, uh, the only thing I wanted to say about the Mastin moment is we might want to, but just like you guys were saying, I doubt that he would want to. <laughs> Dave Mastin, I mean. <laughs> you know, the great thing about Dave is that he's always so willing to sort of, um, to try it anyway. So you can always just sort of softball something at him. He's on Twitter. He's actually quite responsive. Uh, uh, D Mastin on Twitter. Uh, and then Mastin Space Systems is also on, on Twitter. You can always just throw something at him and see if it sticks. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. And so there's that. <laughs> that would be hilarious, though, to have that, you know, two minute lead in for a question explaining something. Then he's just like, oh, I can't talk about that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> folks, that's been your massive moment for this week. See you later. <laughs> it's sort of like our own version of uh, Moment of Zen. Right? Yeah. And here <laughs> is your moment of Zen. And here's your Mastin moment. Uh, no, can't no, talk about that. Thanks. Um, okay. <laughs> Next anyway, though. Let's go I ahead. love it. Next comment comes off of YouTube, of course. Uh, SP123100. Should be 1,000, I feel like. You should change your, your username. Uh, it says, I've been impressed at uh, what the ISRO have achieved. Uh, they, of course, the Indian Space uh, Launch Provider, is what we're saying there. Yeah, is it Indian Space uh, Research Organization? Yep, that's right? right. Perfect, thank you. I appreciate you whispering that so I could pick up on that. Uh, have achieved <laughs> <laughs> on their comparatively modest budget, especially their Mars orbiter. Do you know whether this mishap will affect the launch of the Lunar X Prize payloads early next year? I feel that a problem with this fairing jettison should be quicker to remedy than an issue with one of the stage engines. I hope they are swift to return to flight. Uh, yeah, first of all, we of course hope that. And I, I don't think so. Do, uh, Mike, do you have any more information on that? I. Well, I mean... <sighs> We probably are safe to assume that there will be some delays to all of the missions that are scheduled to go on the PSLV. But just like just like SP one two three one hundred says, I mean, you know, for a payload fairing, you know, they already know what the problem was that it was one of the explosive bolts that that uh, didn't fire to to separate it on time, even though the commands were issued. So um, hopefully they will have a quick turnaround for that. But since the Google Lunar X Prize did extend their deadline to March of twenty eighteen, mm. even if there is a delay, hopefully they'll still be able to launch in time. Yeah, no, that, that's a good Yeah, idea. the Indian uh, uh, um, uh, Google Lunar X Prize team, I mean, Team Indus. Yeah, yeah, that's that's actually a really good point. Uh, you know, it's, it's funny, it's one of the uh, unfortunate things about uh, frangible nuts or exploding bolts. Uh, you can't really test that here on Earth. I mean, you can, but then you can't like really reuse that one and go, great, that one worked, let's, let's use that one then. Yeah, because you yeah, kind of exactly. destroy the bolt. <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's a little Whoops. unfortunate. Sort of like, well, I don't know, they, the rest of the pack worked. So I don't, <laughs> you just expect that one to, to do the same, uh, which is a little unfortunate. But so there's that. But yeah, with the, with the extension, I suppose there's a little bit better chance uh, that this shouldn't delay that end goal, even if it does delay time-wise, like when they're able to launch. So there's that. Looking forward there. Yeah. Uh, next comment comes off of YouTube from Sarah H., uh, I'm surprised you didn't talk about, uh, I can't talk apparently. I'm surprised you didn't talk about how the area where the James Webb telescope is was flooded during Harvey. Uh, I thought we did talk about that a little bit, did we not? 
We actually did talk about that, but not on the live show itself. That was on one of our extra news segments that we oh. released uh, during the week. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's where that comes. So this is a completely legitimate uh, uh, question, Sarah H., but uh, hopefully you did get to see that little news pod that we put out about uh, um, that the hurricane that passed over Texas. So, For yeah. sure. Uh, and if you didn't, it, it, and if you're watching on YouTube, uh, it should be below or, you know, or in our there. video section. Somewhere over here, yeah, over yes, there. Uh, right over there. We're just going to make Ben do all of the things now, and then he's just going to have to figure it out <laughs> Don't later. Don't forget to turn autoplay off. That's a bit <laughs> annoying. So. It can be. Uh, hmm. But, yeah, so we did discuss it in After Dark. If you're watching uh, live here, of course, we will have a couple more news segments in After Dark. And then we will, of course, post them to our YouTube channel a little bit later on in the week. Yes, Jared? Yeah, I just want to say, also, one of the reasons um, that we... We might not have talked about mm -hmm. the the area that the James Webb being tested at being flooded was because it didn't actually flood in the area that James Webb was at. No news, in, no news. Uh, at that Johnson Space Center. So, so yeah, it was secure and it's it's still they were able to maintain the test environment and are continuing to do so. Um, so yeah, yeah, that, which is great news anyway. Working right so. through it. It's hurricanes. We can work right through them. So. Right. MBD. Uh, <laughs> and then last comment for this week, uh, also coming off of YouTube from Scooch, says, uh, so when the X-37B launches on the Falcon 9, most of the rocket will be reused, correct? Just the fairing in the second stage will be lost? And how does that compare to Space Shuttle? And will this be the most reusable orbital flight ever? I applaud you, first mm. of all, for sticking a whole bunch of questions into one question. Yeah, that. that's like five <laughs> questions. <laughs> and it wasn't a wall of text. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, and being very concise about it. I appreciate that as well. Uh, I, I, I don't have any clue what the answer to this one is. Mike, do you have any uh, well, I, insight? Well, yeah. Um, I mean, since this launch already did take place on Thursday, um, the fairing and the second stage, of course, were not recovered, although SpaceX is in the process of being able to attempt recovery of their payload fairings, although I didn't hear about any sort of attempts like that for this mission. <laughs> um, and yes, the uh, X-37B is reusable because it's going to be landing under its own power, but let's not forget that SpaceX's own capsule, Dragon, is also reusable and has come back to Earth several times. Well, not necessarily reusable, reusable, I should say refurbishable, since they've only reflown one of the Dragon capsules that they've flown into space. Sure. But, um, I mean, their Dragons did return to Earth, though, is my point, just sure. like the X-37B did, even if it's not exactly reusable. Um, but, comparing to the Space Shuttle, I mean, they still have to do, SpaceX still has to do refurbishments on their Dragons and on the first stage of the Falcon 9s, but I have a sneaky suspicion that this, the refurbishments that they have to do are way, way more affordable than the refurbishments that had to be done on the Space Shuttle, so... Um, Two billion dollars a launch for space shuttle, I'm sure, is not what SpaceX is getting to to refurbish their oh, man, first. I can't stages. imagine, right? Goodness, I, <laughs> I like uh, Green Jim too in the chat room says, uh, "Q Dave Masting clip." I can't say. <laughs> we should, we should totally just like take that out of the last show and be able to throw it into <laughs> any other show that we feel uh, we feel needs it. Oh, that's uh, good. Yeah, Jared, anything else to add to that one? No, uh, Space Mike said it perfectly. So. Yeah. As as he does. Mm -hmm. It's so annoying sometimes. Okay, Super so, expert, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, I, That's, I don't find it annoying. No, no, it's I'm, good I'm, to have that level of expertise. I'm kidding. So. I'm, of course I'm kidding. Uh, you know, our rocket what? specialist, that's why we call him that. That's why you're our, our resident uh, astronomer. Like, oh I, my you know, gosh. And I just sit here and point to both of you and you say things, and it's great. It just happens to work well, out. But you're <laughs> an important perspective as well. You the are. Sh the short one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's not what I meant, but okay, I know. I'll take it. I, of course, not to be forgotten in any way, shape, or form, we want to make sure we give another <laughs> thank you, a huge thank you to these Patreon supporters. These are the ground support crew. Uh, these people have given us anywhere between one penny and two dollars and 49 cents. You, of course, get your name in the show because we have not forgotten about you. We very much so thank you. I will talk a little bit longer so you can actually find your name in this list because it is kind of long and that typeface is very tiny you would get of course access to our exclusive patreon only hangouts early access to after Dark as soon as it's available on demand thank you thank you thank you uh every single one of you uh, all of our patreon supporters if you are interested in becoming one of those you can head on over to patreon.com slash tmro and i think that about does it for this week guys i yeah? think it does yeah, yeah. we're toast yeah. We, show. we are kind of toast. All right. So in case you're wondering, <laughs> next week, the scheduled guest of the week should be John. Oh, I didn't double check on how to pronounce this. John Amiable? 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 
John. We're going to say John. John will be on the show. John is going to tell us how to say his last name next week on Changing the World, How to Mine Asteroids and Terraform Mars and Venus Profitably, which I think is amazing, in one human lifetime using existing military technology. That is going to be interesting. One human lifetime for terraforming a planet. Uh, Yeah, I... That's some Star Trek level stuff. That is. Right? Wow. I don't have a shirt for that one, you guys. I'm going to have to go shopping this week. Me too. (laughs) (laughs) That's a good one. I like that. I want that. Oh, that maybe that'll be the shirt for next week already. Like that's. I didn't have a shirt for this. I had to go shopping. Uh, All right. So thank you, of course, for joining us and continuing the conversation. Feel free to hit us up on. You know, we're all on Twitter. Tomorrow's on Twitter. We're on Facebook. We're all Mm -hmm. on Facebook. That's right. Uh, We're on YouTube. We're pretty much anywhere that you want us to be we're there and if we're not there yet feel free to suggest it maybe we'll show up unexpectedly so (laughs) join us this week next week to continue the conversation online and in person with your friends and family thank you for joining us this is tomorrow